the, the response has not been good in most parts of the world. It's been quite differentiated. Uh, among the large countries, there have been some success stories. Uh, China is one of them because after the initial outbreak, China stopped the transmission of this virus. Uh, it did it systematically, it did it rigorously, and they have very few cases and very, very few deaths. And neighbors in the Asia Pacific region, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Vietnam, uh, have all done a good job. Uh, they have given strict orders to the population. The population has been very receptive, uh, has responded uh, well. There's been systematic testing, tracing, quarantining. They stopped the transmission. In the US and Europe, it's been a mess. Uh, of course, we had Donald Trump. He was our worst president in modern history, maybe in all of American history, uh, a real moron, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and uh, we ended up with 500,000 deaths uh, because Trump was so incompetent and only interested in his reelection campaign and leaving the country to mass outbreak and mass suffering. We never even tried during 2020 to control this pandemic. I mean, people wore face masks, but the government, the federal government was completely irresponsible. And then in Europe, it's been odd. You know, it's been a, really not an effective response, uh, rather shocking to me because there are some good leaders, but the EU left everything to the 27 members and yet the virus kept crossing the borders uh, and there was uh, no real systematic control. So the outbreak raged. And then you have cases uh, like Brazil where President Bolsonaro uh, is another incompetent and uh, said, this doesn't matter. And then Brazil had a massive explosion. Uh, you have uh, the case of India right now, which is the number one case in the world. Modi started decisively, mm -hmm. but then decided for whatever political reasons or misguided judgment, well, okay, we're done. Opened up. Uh, India had a, a religious festival with more than 2 million people gathering. This is what's called a super spreader event to the nth degree. And now India has the worst pandemic in the whole world. So if you let up the guard, you can end up in disaster. Then there's another part of this story, which is the vaccines. On the one side, a, a scientific triumph that within a year, many vaccines were developed, but not a cooperation triumph by any means because the vaccines have almost entirely been uh, kept for the US and Europe. And we still to this moment don't have a global plan for how everybody is going to get vaccines in a timely way. So I'm not very impressed, I have to say, by the level of global cooperation. Uh, Trump made everything vastly worse. President Biden uh, is a good person trying to get the right things done, but we're still uh, not with the kind of coordinated, cooperative global response. And uh, I'll just uh, conclude uh, by saying that to make all of this work, we need China, the US, Europe, uh, the producers of the vaccines, Russia, to be cooperating together right now and with all the world. And we don't have cooperation among those countries also. So that makes, uh, makes it all very hard. It's, it's, it's very interesting, Professor, because you touched on a few things, you know, international cooperation, you know, the system of government we have, which I thought will, you know, kind of balance if you have something like Trump, but again, that was a different story. Yeah. <laughs> and and thing. But so speaking of cooperation, uh, cooperation international, what's your thought on WHO? You know, it has been criticized for their response. I, I am those those people who think, you know, they don't have enough tools, they're underfunded, those kind of people have come to that side. But what's your thought on, on WHO and how they handle the COVID? 
first, we need a strong and effective WHO in the world. So if there are shortcomings, we need to fix them. We can't do without WHO. It is the center of the international system health response. And it has to be. If it didn't exist, as they say, we'd have to invent it. But it was invented already in 1948. So it's uh, 73 years uh, going, and we need to make sure that it works effectively. In 2020, WHO was badly stymied again by Trump, who actually pulled the US out of WHO support in the middle of the pandemic. This is what happens when you have a just a psychopath as president, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, that really weakened WHO. But the, in general, WHO depends on big power backing. And it depends on the big powers saying, we're going to use this global organization as the vehicle of cooperation. And that has really not happened effectively enough. And so whenever there's bickering among the giants, uh, you know, you end up getting uh, everyone else uh, stuck in the middle of this, including the, the multilateral institutions. As a general matter, all multilateral institutions are underfunded. Uh, this is another part of the long-term story because the the powerful countries say, why do we want a powerful United Nations? They'll tell us what we can't do. And the United States doesn't want to be told what not to do. But we need an international system that's strong and effective. And we need a larger budget in the long term. But in the short term, we have to build. So how is WHO done? Mediocre. Uh, this, this is the truth. It, it hasn't been properly backed. The response, uh, it's often been ignored. Uh, it has not been utilized as the clearinghouse for everything that needs to be done. And my goal and attempt in my own work in this area is to give WHO the support and to say to all of the big powers, you cannot solve this problem through big power politics. This has to be solved through multilateral professional organizations like WHO. So you better give it more backing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting seeing how this uh, international organization are handling them. So let's touch a little bit about the economy. So uh, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts. What should countries do to mitigate the risk of COVID to the economy? It, it's, it's a big impact. You know, the, the main uh, economic policy is public health. So the main thing that we need is to stop the pandemic. And that has two parts to it. One is the, uh, the non-vaccine part. And that really means monitoring, testing, tracing, stopping large gatherings, preventing super spreader events. In other words, all of the things you can do when you don't have a vaccine at hand. And then the second is the comprehensive vaccine coverage because that can not only protect each person but also by itself stop an epidemic because uh, when you're protected, you don't spread the disease as well, at least not as much as when you're not protected. You might still get infected, but not spread it the same way as you would without the vaccine. So these are the two components. For the prevention side, we need to learn from China. We need to learn from New Zealand, Australia. What is a rigorous control policy that doesn't stop the economy, but does stop the virus? That's what they accomplished. For the vaccine part, we desperately need a global plan because the United States has vaccinated about half the population now. It's really slowed down because a lot of people don't want the vaccine, which is a big mistake. But it means the U.S. is going to have a lot of surplus supply. And that has to go to the rest of the world. That's the basic point. But we don't have a plan for that till today, which is a shame. And so I'm really strongly advocating WHO, 
to have that central plan for allocating all of the vaccine doses so that we have coverage in every country in the world on a mass basis so that the whole world by early 2022 can basically get this under control. It's possible, but it's possible that we miss the occasion. We get new variants, you know, many bad things are possible, but control is also feasible. So yeah. I just uh, all morning uh, working with the public health officials to say, speed up, speed up. We got to hurry before things get out of control. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then how do we turn this crisis to an opportunity once it's over? Well, I think one of the things we've learned is that we can do a lot online, by the way. So just as we're yes. doing. And, uh, you know, so much of the economy is now uh, online. So the, the first thing I would say to any country is comprehensive digital coverage for the post-COVID economy. And President Kagame, of course, is the co-chair of the UN Broadband Commission. The UN Broadband Commission is the uh, organization of the UN, of the uh, International Telecommunications Union and UNESCO, which is aiming for universal digital access. And this is the first recommendation I would make to every country. You can't really have a 21st century economy without broadband and without really uh, everybody online because the kids won't be getting the schooling that they need, which it is going to be online or blended. Uh, telemedicine won't work. Payment systems won't work. E-commerce won't work. Government services won't work unless the population is online. So I'd like to see a massive investment in universal digital access, 5G throughout Africa. I wanna see Huawei complete the systems that it started building uh, and uh, get this uh, connectivity everywhere. I also think we need to use this opportunity to shift to the kind of clean green economy uh, that we need for the future as well, because standing behind the COVID risk is the climate risk. And so one of the things that I find very exciting is the chance for a mass, mass build out of wind, hydro and solar power. And this is, again, in the African context, I think there's a fantastic opportunity for a big leapfrogging to universal electrification on mini grids, microgrids, solar fields and massive hydropower build out say the Congo Basin, which we've talked about for decades, but haven't built uh, that hydropower. That is how I would aim for the post-COVID period. Yeah. Sustainable development, digital, green, and the SDGs. Get the kids in school, get everyone on healthcare using the digital technologies. I so I had a question about what's the challenges uh, this crisis poses on international cooperation. But let me rephrase this question a little bit different. Do you have hope for international cooperation? Looking how we responded to you know this COVID, which basically impacts all of us. Where climate change impacts you people, you don't see every day in your life. What's the, the future hope for that? There's always hope because it's in our mutual interest to cooperate. Uh, on the other hand, human beings are a strange species. <laughs> we, we move between cooperation and disaster, and we, we're never quite sure which one we're gonna choose next. So we need to understand that we're in a fragile situation. We have these powerful technologies, whether it's vaccines, renewable energy, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, all of these new, technologies that can be brought to bear, but we need a financial and a logistical strategy to do it. And we need to do it cooperatively because otherwise we'll never reach scale. So if it had been Trump still in power it would be impossible. The man was a lunatic, uh, but with Biden, we have a very rational uh, president who understands the importance of cooperation. That's a very good thing. He hosted 
uh, a uh, climate summit uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, and brought world leaders uh, together. And I thought it was a very successful event. I'm, I'm a big fan of the world leaders Zooming together uh, every <laughs> week so that they could actually meet inexpensively, not get on their airplanes, but just talk with each other and work out, practically speaking, how to solve all these problems that we're talking about. Because I think that if they actually are dealing face to face with each other, they can uh, address these problems. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, everybody knows this, the pandemic has been uh, really harsh to specific to poor countries. Uh, I, I, I think I saw is a World Bank or IMF report saying more than half a million people will move to extreme poverty uh, uh, this year or last year, actually. So uh, my question is, how can develop, developing countries evaluate policy choices that can raise the long term growth and mobilize uh, more revenue and attract private investment to help achieve the you know, SDGs. When you look at what's happening right now, uh, all countries are aiming for investment-led growth. That's the right strategy. But the rich countries have a big advantage, which is that they can borrow huge amounts from the marketplace at very low interest and use that for financing. So the United States has had three big financial packages in the last 14 months that have totaled $5 trillion. Our central bank, the Federal Reserve, has printed about $3 trillion of money. So, uh, because everyone wants dollars. So you're, the US is able to issue massive credits, borrow heavily. But suppose uh, that, that uh, uh, Rwanda tried that, <laughs> the currency would go haywire completely interest rates would soar. Uh, and so poor countries can't do what the rich countries are doing. And I'm saying to the rich countries, look, you can't hog all of this uh, borrowing capacity for yourselves. You have to make that borrowing capacity available for the rest of the world too, because there's a lot of savings glut, but the financial markets won't direct it to the emerging markets and to the frontier market, so-called, except at very high interest rates. So I think that there are a couple of things that need to be done. One we, will get done, we'll have a, a special drawing rights, SDR allocation in June, which will give all countries more liquidity. This will be very helpful, even to enable the poor countries to borrow more on their own on a market base. But the second thing I'm calling for is for the rich countries to provide a, a large amount of fresh capital to the so-called multilateral development banks like the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, the World Bank, and so on. Because those institutions, if they have a stronger balance sheet, can then lend hundreds of billions of dollars to countries to build the infrastructure. Because what I would say to every country, build out electricity, build out digital, get your kids in school, uh, get the healthcare coverage. Those are all the basics. The rest will follow of a strong economy if you get all of that going. But that requires money up front. And that's what I think the... Uh, multilateral development banks can do, but they don't have a strong enough balance sheet now. So the rich countries that have a strong balance sheet should be, fin should be pushing or guiding finance at a large scale, hundreds of billions of dollars to the developing countries so that the developing countries are able to leapfrog. Yeah, so we're running out of time, but let me ask one question, then take questions quickly from uh, the, the audience. As my last question is, how can we restructure development aid to be more effective? I, I think that uh, the key is big, clear goals mm -hmm. set with timelines. For example, universal digital access by 2030 in all of Africa. So you set a goal like that, then you say, what do we need? Well, we need a lot more fiber. Uh, terrestrial fiber. The submarine cables are coming now, but we need the terrestrial fiber. 
then we need to make sure that the schools are online, that the public health system's online. Then we need probably a pricing strategy to help poor kids get, uh, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet, so that they can participate in education, you know, classrooms online and so forth. Turns out the amounts involved are not that large, but they're beyond the means of any individual government. We need a, a long-term financial strategy for that, I think through the African Development Bank as a, as a critical partner. But the, the point is, and, and this is something that, uh, that, that uh, President Kagame has known uh, all along is aid should not just be little pieces here and there. It should be directed towards a national strategy. And for that, you need large amounts that are coherent. And I think the best way to do this now is large infrastructure building, whether it's the power, the water and sanitation, the preparation for electric vehicles, uh, and the build out of the especially education system uh, with a heavy online component. These are the goals that I would set. And then I think the financing, as I've been saying, can be mobilized around meeting those very ambitious goals. But the other point of everything about development should be high ambition right now, because well-designed development strategies can lead to a doubling of income every 10 years or even faster. China, which went from poverty to wealth over 40 years, had a doubling time for the economy of every seven years. Incredible. Uh, they were growing 10% a year. Every seven years, the economy was doubling. And that meant that over the 40 years, uh, you had uh, roughly uh, five doublings, uh, even a little bit more. And that's what uh, allowed China to end poverty. And that's what Africa should be aiming for right now as well. Excellent. So let's take questions from the audience. I, I couldn't agree more. I think these international organizations, they need some reforms, especially after covid uh, that really could, they could be more effective in what they're doing. But anyway. Absolutely. We're going to be pushing on that. <laughs> please keep doing the wonderful work you're doing, Professor. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, and we look forward to hosting Rwanda here after COVID. Always Bravo. I, I will be there. I'm <laughs> waiting to get to Kigali. Thanks. I, I Thanks so much. Thank you, Professor. Great to see you. Everybody. Have a good one, everybody.